Once again, warm welcome to you as you join us here at St. Olaf Church. It's great to have you with us. Uh, as always, the weather in Durban is a little bit on the warm side, but it's a joy to be together and to look at God's Word. Uh, just before we get there, just please pray for Joan Rich. She's a member of our church and uh, is in hospital at um, Interbeni. She's had her gallbladder removed, and so we pray for day today. And we also remember Bronwyn uh, Valerie, who's going through some uh, tests um, at Parklands, and we pray for Simon and for Bronwyn. Now, what I thought I'd do today as we approach the Easter uh, uh, season is to look backwards. And so I'm going to a passage in Romans chapter 3 where Paul explains all the great events that we're going to be remembering over the next uh, few weeks, the crucifixion, the resurrection of Jesus, which of course are the cornerstones of our faith and our belief. But here in Romans chapter 3, Paul is explaining this almost a generation later to a new generation of Christians and believers as to what it was all about and why Jesus needed to go through that uh, whole process. And of course, it is all about our own salvation. So let me read you a few verses from Romans chapter 3 and from verse 21. And I've called it God's solution. But now apart from the law, the righteousness of God has been made known to which the law and the prophets testify. This righteousness is given through faith in Jesus Christ to all who believe. There is no difference between Jew and Gentile. For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. And all are justified freely by His grace through the redemption that came by Christ Jesus. God presented Christ as a sacrifice of atonement through the shedding of His blood to be received by faith. And He did this to demonstrate His righteousness because in His forbearance He had left the sins committed beforehand unpunished. He did it to demonstrate His righteousness at the present time so as to be just and the one who justifies those who have come to faith in Christ. Now Paul is building an argument here and uh, so far before we get to this passage which is all about righteousness through faith which is God's solution he's been sh showing the terrible extent of the fallenness of the human condition or to use the words of the older writers man's depravity. You catch a glimpse of that in verse 10 of chapter 3. There is no one righteous not even one. And we do well to remember that. It is a description of the human condition. We human beings are not fundamentally good. Paul's assessment of our condition is absolutely right, that there is no one righteous, not even one. Or as Ivan Turgenev once said, I do not know what the heart of a bad man is like, but I do know what the heart of a good man is like, and it is terrible. And so, no wonder... Donald Barnhouse, the great Presbyterian uh, minister of a bygone era, coming now to Romans chapter 3 and verse 21, the verses we read a bit earlier, he says of these verses, I'm convinced today after many years of Bible study that these verses are the most important verses in the whole Bible because they explain all that Jesus came to do uh, and all that has been achieved in terms of our salvation. So let's have a look at it under three headings. First of all, the righteousness of God is revealed. Now, what Donald Barnhouse did on one occasion to try and um, illustrate God's perfectness, holiness, on the one hand, and our total corruption on the other hand, is that he used a yardstick and he called it a divine measure. And at the top, he wrote Christ's words from Matthew chapter 5 and verse 48, Be perfect, therefore as your heavenly Father is perfect. So God is perfect. And then down the vertical line, he wrote down several conditions of uh, human beings according to various degrees of righteousness as we understand it. And so about 75%, at 75% righteousness, this would include sort of normal, decent, ordinary folk. You might even go a bit higher than that, maybe get into the 80s or 90s and include people like uh, Mother Teresa. And then uh, you would come down to the sort of 20% and you would include murderers, hijackers, and all those who are uh, uh, corrupt. Uh, and that's how we see it. But none of us gets up to the 100%. That is the point that he's making. No human being 
gets up to the 100% mark or level, which is the standard that God sets. And he summarizes it in chapter 3 and verse 23. For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. None of us, none of us, even the most uh, decent human being that we know, and, they are, and we know some of them, uh, but none of them have achieved that 100%. The only human being who ever achieved God's radical standard of righteousness was Jesus Christ. He's the only person who has ever lived who deserved eternal life simply on the basis of how he lived. And so it's because of that that he is the one who is able and he's the only one who is able to atone for our sins and bring us back into right relationship with God. Now, given what we've just been saying, God's dilemma with us human beings has always been the same. And that is that he can't just pass over sin. And that's why in the Old Testament, as he dealt with his own people, the Jewish people, that's why they had the blood sacrifice system as a way of reminding them on an ongoing basis that in fact they were not perfect, they were unworthy, and that blood needed to be shed in order to be, for sin to be atoned for. It was a visual demonstration, a visual aid of the need of the shedding of blood in order to get right with God. But now we come to New Testament times, the New Covenant times. How could God justify sinful people? And there's a rather startling phrase in Romans chapter 4 and verse 5. It says, God justifies the wicked. Now there's the question. How does God justify the wicked? How does he justify human beings? All of us, even ordinary people who essentially are not good. We essentially are corrupt. It seems here that God is going against everything that he has said. Earlier on in the Old Testament, he has said, I will not acquit the guilty. How on earth can Paul affirm that God does what he forbids others to do? How can God justify the wicked? How can the righteous God overthrow the moral order? And it would be unbelievable and it would be impossible were it not for the cross. Because God must be God and God must act consistently with his own being and with his own character. And so the solution that God finds is that a great exchange takes place. And I can do no better than re read uh, Jim Phillip, who's a Scotsman. He says, an exchange takes place in which the Lord lays on him, that is Jesus, the iniquity of us all and bestows on his people perfect righteousness. And to illustrate that, if I may, in a very simple way, this is us over here. Our sin is weighing heavily upon us. The sin is illustrated by this black diary. Here on the other hand is Jesus who is perfectly righteous and sinless. And so the great exchange takes place and God transfers my sin and your sin away from myself and yourself. And it is laid on Jesus and God now views me and you as though we are absolutely righteous and perfect. Now, we are not actually righteous and perfect, but we call this the imputation of sin, that our sin is exchanged or imputed to Christ. And it's this great exchange which lies at the heart of the gospel and indeed makes it uh, the gospel. So the righteousness of God is revealed. Secondly, we're going to talk about redemption in Christ Jesus. This is verses 24 and 25. That we are justified freely by his grace through the redemption that came by Christ Jesus. God presented Christ as a sacrifice of atonement through the shedding of his blood to be received by faith. Now, of course, this word redemption, it comes from the commercial world of Paul's day. It really means to be redeemed. It means deliverance. Well, at that time in the business world, it, means, it meant a deliverance from the payment of a price so that a prisoner could go free. And that is what is happening here. Paul is borrowing the term and he is saying and using it in a way that it is liberation and redemption from the wrath of God. It is liberation and redemption from sin and from death. And the ransom price that is, is paid now when it comes to God's gospel is not a sum of money, but it is in fact the very blood of our Lord Jesus Christ. And so 
as we accept what he has done for us, the price that he's paid, and we receive what he has done by faith, so the guilt of our sin is transferred onto him. The price has been paid. God views you and me as though we have never sinned. So the cross is, to use an old word, the cross is the propitiation of God's wrath. That simply means the cross turns away God's anger that otherwise would be there towards us. To propitiate means to appease. It means to turn away their anger. You know, our problem in the world in which we live is that many of the folk that I know and you know and who live around me here where we live in Durban, their understanding of God, their view of God is that he's some kind of sort of sentimental old grandfather and that he can be manipulated and that we can change his mind and that we can get him to do what we think and expect he ought to be doing. That is not the Bible's view of God. That is not how God presents himself in the pages of Scripture. Uh, God is not a weak character. No, God is perfect and holy and just and sin arouses uh, his wrath. And so it needs to be turned away. It needs to be appeased. There's nothing that we can do to placate the anger of God. We've got no means whatsoever to do it. And so he has to come up with a plan. And that is what he does in sending his son to die in the world. And so... God, because he loves us, and in his undeserved love, what he has done for us is something that we could never do for ourselves. And John Stott puts it like this, and he says, God's own great love propitiated, atoned, his own holy wrath through the gift of his own dear son, who took our place, bore our sin, died our death, and thus God gave himself to save us from himself. And I would recommend uh, John Stott's book on the cross of Christ. It's one of the most thorough and readable works on everything that we're talking about um, this morning. Now, finally, as we close, and this is just a bit of a lead up, as I say again, to Easter. And I hope you'll come back and join us in the coming weeks as we Look at the events of Palm Sunday and Good Friday and the resurrection of Jesus as well. But finally, we have to receive what God has done for us uh, by faith. And that's what verse 22 says. This righteousness is given through faith. Verse 25 says uh, the same thing, that it has to be received by faith. And verse 28 says, for we maintain that a person is justified by faith apart from the works of the law. Now, one of the old reformers called this sola fide, which means by faith himself. Now, just one small point here. It's not our faith that saves us. It's the faith that we have in the object of our faith, who, of course, is Christ and Christ alone. And so as we believe in him and as we trust in him, we find ourselves as sinners being raised from helplessness to a position of hope we see and understand and know that there is a way back to God. It's apart from the law. We cannot save ourselves. There's nothing we can do. And so this wonderful gospel proclaims to us a free forgiveness, a new life. We've done nothing to deserve it. Um, we've done a lot to deserve judgment. But here God in his love uh, gives us this opportunity and this way of coming back into right relationship with him. And that is why Christianity really is not a religion at all. Uh, it's a gospel. It's the gospel. It's good news that God's grace has turned away his wrath, that God's Son has died our death, borne our judgment. God has mercy on the undeserving. And that all that we can do, there's nothing, there's nothing that we can contribute in any way, but we simply, by faith, receive what God offers. That, of course, means that there's no no boasting. There's, there's nothing that we can boast about. And it means that every single Christian is on an equal footing because the ground at the foot of the cross is level and we all have to come the same way. Thank you for joining me today. And if you've never ever reached out and received God's grace for yourself in your own way, in your own personal way, why not do that today? 
And Lord, the way that we do it is to A, admit that we are sinners, as Paul has been saying in Romans, admit our sin. Uh, Lord, turn away from our sin. B, believe in Christ and all that he has done. And C, commit ourselves to you by faith as we receive this wonderful, wonderful message of the gospel and personally entrust our lives to Jesus. And I pray for anyone who may be doing that right now. Lord, may they know through your spirit that there is now a change and that new life has come to them. And this we ask and pray in Jesus' name. Amen.